Welcome to The Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. I'm Jenna Ellis. Join me on Jenna Ellis tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern for Thursday's Roundup. Our power panel will be back with the top trending topics of the week, which include a lot of political headlines, including a recent poll from Fox News that was released that show a swing of independence nine points in favor of Joe Biden. What does this portend? Heading in especially to the debate next week. Stay tuned for the Salem News Channel as well because Jenna Ellis tonight will have a very special episode next week uh, for a response to the debate for 90 minutes after that debate. But tune in tonight for that preview. We'll also have attorney Micah Donnelly breaking down the oral argument at the Supreme Court on the next iteration of Masterpiece Cake Shop case and why the Supreme Court and our laws should not be able to compel speech that you and I fundamentally disagree with. All that and more tonight, 9 p.m. Hi friends, Jenna Ellis, host of Jenna Ellis Tonight, and we are experiencing instability at every level. Our government lacks leadership and Bidenomics has been an utter disaster. The economy is in a fragile state. Inflation has been a constant issue. High interest rates have put significant pressure on the real estate market. There have been major bank failures and many analysts say a stock market correction is likely overdue. We have global conflicts in Europe and the Middle East and those have the potential to spread, but gold has soared to record highs even among the tensions. So there are so many reasons that Americans should consider wise investing and investments in gold and silver and legacy precious metals is the gold standard. I love Legacy Precious Metals because of their zero hassle education first approach. They can help you roll your traditional IRA into a gold IRA or ship metals directly to your house. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, download the free investor guide, and I have read it. There is so much valuable information there. Friends, now is the time to not roll the dice on your hard earned money, find out about the growth potential that is in gold and that gold offers you. Contact Legacy Precious Metals and make sure to tell them that I sent you. Good evening and welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. So we're a week out from the first presidential debate. A lot of people are anticipating it will be the only presidential debate. We'll see about that, but that coming uh, next Thursday and we are a couple of weeks ahead of President Trump's sentencing hearing on July 11th in the New York City case. So some polls are starting to reflect that shift in some of the independent votes. So this coming from interactive polls, uh, the 2024 general election from Fox News this is a Fox News poll in March. Trump, Trump was 50 percent uh, plus five from Biden at 45 percent. In May, Trump was 49 percent, only plus one ahead of Biden at 48. And now June, Biden is at 50 percent plus two and Trump at 48 percent. So a net seven point swing towards Biden. And this uh, was something also that I tweeted from the Fox News poll, Biden versus Trump rematch. This coming from the Fox News poll, quote, the key is that independents favor Biden by nine points, a shift from May when they prefer to Trump by two points. And so Fox News also had this graphic for the uh, topics and the subject matter that were, quote, extremely important to the 2024 vote. This according to their uh, poll of registered voters, plus or minus 3%. The future of democracy, um, however you interpret that phrase, topped the list at 68%. The economy was next at 66%. Stability slash normalcy. 58%, and then immigration, healthcare, abortion, and guns rounded out those top topics. So let's discuss this with our panel for Thursday's roundup of the top trending topics.
And let's welcome in today's power panel. We have Robin Biro, who is a Democrat strategist and a veteran of the U.S. military. We also have Tho Bishop, who is a content director at the Mises Institute. And joining us as well as Alan West, who is the newly elected chairman of the Dallas GOP. So gentlemen, welcome. Um, Alan West, let's go to you first, since uh, you are new on our power panel, but definitely not new to the show. Um, what do you make of this independent swing? Should we blame this on the messaging around Trump's conviction? Uh, is this something else? Or is this just yet another poll that the Trump campaign is going to say, hey, this isn't favorable to us. It's Fox News. So we should just you know, completely disregard it. Well, I don't think you should disregard anything. I think that it really does come back to the messaging. You've looked out there and seen a lot of the convicted felon, convicted felon, convicted felon. Uh, demonization and castigation. But I think that when you look at that top uh, you know, issue, the future of democracy, that's very nebulous. And one of the things that the left has been very good at doing is talking about America as a democracy and not a constitutional republic and not talking about the rule of law and not talking about the means by which Joe Biden is violating the rule of law. When you look at what is happening in our border, he's in complete violation of Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. So I think that what you have to see is better messaging, stay on that message, and that that's one of the big challenges for, for President Trump, especially if you only get this one shot come next week to have that debate. So it is messaging uh, without a doubt. And I think that the RNC and President Trump's campaign has to do a much better job of that. Yeah, and Robin, let's talk about this um, kind of vague and nebulous term. I agree with Alan West's commentary there about the future of democracy, because that's what the left loves to uh, talk about when they're trying to impugn Donald Trump. But, you know, Joe Biden hasn't exactly had a stellar record on uh, in terms of closing the border, the economy and the future of our constitutional republic. So what do you make of that term, as vague as it is, topping the chart of extremely important topics heading into November? For a Fox News poll, that surprises me. That is something I would expect from an MSNBC or CNN poll, frankly. Uh, so I think that maybe the left's messaging for once in our lives uh, is maybe working. But listen, Jenna, I've heard this same argument from my peers on the left for probably two decades. Uh, the, sky's fall, the sky was falling whenever Mc, John McCain was running. The sky was falling whenever Mitt Romney was running. I mean, it's always the same thing. Uh, but look, I've got to just <laughs> ease the mind of my, my friends on the right. At this exact day in time in 2012, uh, Mitt Romney was up by three points. So I'm still a little bit skeptical of polls, mm. and I caution my friends on the left to not be overconfident. Yeah, and, and that's always good, regardless of polls, because it seems like, though, um, the Republicans will always tout the polls that were, are in their favor, certainly. Uh, the Trump campaign will do that. But then with polls like this, it seems like uh, now out of hand, Republicans are rejecting and they're saying, oh, well, Paul Ryan controls Fox News. So of course, this is skewed. I mean, it seems like um, polls are just an attempt of confirmation bias uh, one way or the other. Um, but I think that it's very concerning, quite frankly, that you are seeing this shift in independence and this nine point swing. Uh, Republicans really should not be so overconfident. And so what do you make of that fact as well as the economy being second in uh, that poll of the, the most extremely important topics? Well, I think that last point's the most important. As long as you have these nebulous terms, again, no one really cares about democracy, right? Attacks on democracy simply means that you're concerned that your team is losing. No one really cares about these things. And as long as voters are you know, paying lip service to these uh, kind of abstract topics, rather than dealing with the, the, table, or the kitchen table issues of the economy, then that's gonna be bad for Trump. You know, what you need is people rejecting the last four years. They need people feeling hardship and willing to go back to nostalgia of what the Trump years brought. And so, you know, the economy is still performing pretty well, but you don't want the economy if you're Team Trump as a second place issue. I think what's more interesting right now is if you go to a state by state basis, right, with a, a Trump's lead in Iowa, for example, being much, much larger than it has been in the past, that has impact over the Midwest states. There was a poll that showed Biden only up in eight points in New York. I think some of those state by state polls, I mean, particularly given the, the electoral college we're in, um, you know, you can find more of a, a silver lining there from the Trump world right now. But I think the entire narrative that we had after the conviction that, oh, this is going to rally new people behind Trump, I think that was always a, a heavy dosage of cope from the Trump campaign. It's simply good for, for mobilizing your base, it was good for fundraising. But I think the idea that it's gonna to appeal to some of the suburban voters that have never been great for Trump 
in the past, that it, that was going to suddenly turn them over to their side. I think that was always kind of a false narrative that the Trump campaign, or at least a lot of the, the proxies around, um, were pitching that I, I don't think is viable. Yeah, and so Alan West, um, you know, kind of to wrap up this this part of the topic, um, how would you suggest to the RNC and the Trump campaign moving forward um, to combat this whole narrative of convicted felon, and especially as we're heading into uh, the sentencing hearing that is likely going to take place, it's at least scheduled, on July 11th, um, because I, I agree with Bo, I don't think that this is actually playing as well as the Trump camp is hoping that it will. Well, I think one of the key things is that you have to start talking about how, you know, this trial was a misdemeanor and all of a sudden got elevated to a felony offense. This was, trial uh, was something that the Federal Elections mm -hmm. Commission had passed over. It was passed the statute of limitations. So let's talk about some of the facts around the case. But I agree with the gentleman when you start talking about the kitchen table issues. Here in Dallas, the city of Dallas is the number two city in the country for sex trafficking. That's because of a failed border. When you start to talk about allowing illegals to vote and be counted in the census, well, that is a threat to our representative democracy. Illegals should not be allowed to do that. And again, I think that we have to start talking about, look at what just happened in Maryland, where a 37-year-old mother of five was raped and killed by an illegal immigrant. We had a 13-year-old that was raped in New York City. We've got to start talking about those issues that are affecting people on the ground. And when you go into inner city communities, the crime and the rampant uh, rise of that crime, I think that's what Blacks and Hispanics here in Dallas County are concerned about. And I think that that's what a lot of people are concerned about about, as well as the high price of gasoline, the prices of groceries. So it's about talking about the things that Joe and Jane Sixpack are talking about. And I'm sure my fellow veteran understands exactly the reference that I'm making uh, in their everyday lives. Yeah, and and so um, let's talk about you know some of the independents as well that Trump absolutely needs to bring into his fold if he wants to win in 2024. And we just saw on Tuesday night, the outcome of that uh, very highly anticipated primary in Virginia with Representative Bob Good, who is the chair of the Freedom Caucus, uh, getting primaried, um, I think, largely because of just a very narrow margin, because Trump endorsed his primary opponent, who is on record, you know, applauding that Kamala Harris was uh, the first woman vice president and, you know, a lot of other things that aren't necessarily as stellar as uh, Bob Good's 100% a conservative voting record. So um, is this going to backfire on Trump when he is pursuing what a lot of independents, moderates, and disaffected Republicans see as revenge instead of just saying, you know what, we're going to pursue conservatives and I don't care, we need to all be team players at this point to coalesce the base. Well, I think it is an example of Trump failing in the role as leader of the party. Um, by you know handing over uh, too many of these endorsements to you know whoever Kevin McCarthy wanted or Speaker Johnson wanted, um, you know that was just the one of a, a large string of really bad endorsements setting the establishment side over kind of the, the America First movement. Um, now whether or not that's going to impact voters, I mean it might affect enthusiasm here in June, enthusiasm maybe carrying over in July based off some of these further uh, down ballot primaries go. But I think when it comes down to November. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll vent, they'll frustrate, they'll have, I told you so when you have the issues coming up in Congress and votes not going his way. But I don't think it's going to have a major impact in terms of the general. All right. We've got only about a minute left in this segment. So, Robin, let's turn to you. Speaking of enthusiasm, are you seeing uh, Biden with some of his campaign strategy getting any sort of enthusiasm and bridging that gap when he has an abysmal approval rating heading into the debate? Jenna, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, look, Trump left office, I think, with a 39.9% approval rating, but Biden's is worse right now. It's like 37.4% uh, the last time I checked. And that is concerning uh, because, as we know, Trump didn't get reelected in 2020 with an approval rating that low. So uh, I'm concerned. Uh, but look, it's not translating in terms of financial contributions because Joe Biden somehow is able to rake in a huge financial haul. Uh, monetarily. Yeah. So I, I, I need yeah. to dig well, deeper into where Yeah, well, and we got to leave it there, that... but um, Robin, yeah. yeah, we do need to dig deeper, and we will with the power panel right after this.
Well, friends, you might have heard that Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way that they used to. They've been part of this cancel culture, so they want to pass along the savings directly to you by having a $25 extravaganza. I love that word, extravaganza. <laughs> when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company. With the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some you may not even know about. To get the word out, I want to invite my listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use My Pillows are just $25. My Pillow sandals, also awesome, only $25. Their six pack towel sets are $25. And brand new four pack dish towels, you guessed it, just $25. For the first time ever, the premium My Pillows with the all new Giza fabric, just $25. And orders over $75 will receive free shipping too. This amazing offer won't last long. Go to mypello.com, use the promo code Jenna, or call 800 564 8475 today. That's 800 564 8475, or go to mypello.com and use the promo code Jenna. Let's welcome back in our power panel for this week's top trending topics. We have Robin Biro, we have Tho Bishop, and we have Alan West joining us today. So gentlemen, uh, Biden's student loan forgiveness had a lot of attention this week, particularly on X, uh, this tweet coming from a Capitol Hill staffer named Ben Kamins. He tweeted this, just got a call to let me know my student debt has been canceled. This is why elections matter. Thanks, Joe Biden. He also included a picture of his a bill that was only like $2,500 and then, you know, $5,500 that had been canceled. And the ratio was fantastic of saying, you know, hey, you're just a freeloader now um, because this is going to the American taxpayers. So Robin, um, let's come to you. I mean, how big of an issue is this type of, I think, obviously, um, just vote fishing from the student loan uh, group? It, how much is that really going to impact or convert any votes or enthusiasm that we're talking about in the last segment for Joe Biden? Oh, uh, make no mistake, Jenna, this is pandering. Uh, and and pol all politicians do it, let's face it. Uh, but I myself have seen some of my friends now saying, I'm definitely all in for Joe Biden because my student loan debt got forgiven. Uh, but look, I've, I know we've got another veteran on the panel and I'm super excited about that. I just wanna say my student loan debt, maybe I think $3,400 of it, was uh, forgiven by joining the military. And I love that. I would encourage fellow Americans to pursue that specifically. Join the military, join the police force. I think that they need to give back to the country in order to give their, get their student loan debt forgiven, Jenna. Yeah, and that's really well put. So, so um, let's come to you in terms of the student loan debt and in terms of addressing the economy, President Trump has touted his uh, no tax on tips for the service industry. And a lot of people, including Matt Walsh, are even suggesting, well, why just focus on that? I mean, that still counts as income. And part of the reason that Americans do tip is because uh, that counts generally toward the service industry and server's income. So why the preferential treatment just based on that? I mean, to Robin's point, is it that also kind of pandering for votes? Or do you think that that is actually a good plan? It is a level of pandering, but it's you know, anytime you can get a tax cut, I'll take it. Um, you know, I'd love to have an abolishment of the income tax across the board, but if you can start yes. working with those gifts, then that works right there. Um, but it is, I think one of the remarkable things is the fact that Trump's numbers with younger voters is as strong as it is right now, despite the obvious pandering here. And But there is a, a much larger issue here, which is the, the extent to which younger generations are saturated with debt, have worse career prospects than, their, than previous generations did. I mean, we just saw in you know European politics the extent to which we saw a massive shift to the right because of issues like crime, because of issues like immigration, because of issues like the economy and inflation. And eventually, Republicans are going to need to, to wrap their arms around this. The problem is, is that the Democrat solution of bailouts doesn't address the systemic issues that's leading to that debt issue. But also, if we just simply have a mindset on the right to ignore this issue, to left a lot to own it, then you're, you're going to create a generation of young people that never have enough financial stability to get married, to buy a house, to do those things that leads to a conservative mindset and an investment in the future. Um, so again, this is a it's a, it's a partisan bailout. It, it's, it is what it is. They're very explicit about this, but it does reflect a much, much larger issue that I would like to see Republicans get serious about. Yeah, I agree. 
the 16th amendment should be repealed and we should go to uh, what you know what florida is doing with its surplus by having um that's more of a sales tax based uh, revenue system and um you know there's no income tax for the state of florida i love governor santis's plan there and of course it wasn't just exclusive to him but uh but alan west you know let's have you jump in here um with this whole student loan type of pandering contrasting that with donald trump's plan for the economy and just the fact i mean you cannot contest that americans were better off now than they were under the trump administration and so how much should trump push the economy and these issues like student loans i mean for for this guy ben cammons who's saying you know yay thanks joe biden um he, i think he's an idiot for not realizing that he's going to end up over the course of his life paying way more in taxes than if he just paid off a few thousand dollars of his student loan you're absolutely right and i want to echo what robin said at a time when we have uh, a lack of recruiting and retention numbers in our united states military what would be a better way than to serve your country? And I just got back from Normandy. You think about, you know, what they did there. They were not getting paid nor anywhere near as much. So I think that when you look at this issue about, you know, relieving college student loan debt, let's go back and talk about this future democracy issue. Uh, Joe Biden does not have the constitutional authority, enumerated power to do that. Even Nancy Pelosi said that he did not have the authority to do that. That's supposed to come through the House of Representatives. So if we continue to have a governing system where someone believes that they can just do anything that they want by executive order or edict to include making uh, illegal uh, citizens, that's going to be an economic burden. And I think that what the uh, Republicans should do is just use the words of James Carville and say, it's the economy, stupid, and just go back and continue to talk about that and hammer on that message because that's the thing that the American people are feeling the most. Yeah, and and so let's go back to you um, just on the economy for a moment, uh, because I agree with Alan West that this is unconstitutional and um, may ultimately be litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so for some of these students that are receiving these kind of forgiveness plans and bailouts, um, should they be concerned that ultimately this is going to be overridden and uh, maybe consider their vote in that light? Well, I definitely think, again, I litigated again the Supreme Court since it's already been had issues up there. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, there, there is a, a level of concern in terms of long term viability here. But, hey, you know, we're in a political process where, you know, whatever happens you know, when, when November comes, you know, deal with the consequences afterwards. And again, that's the problem of, of our entire political system is focusing on this, right? It's, it's short term, short term, short term. Debt's piling up. Spending's unsustainable. You know, we're, we're not capable. Our political institutions right now are not capable of any sort of long term decision making. Everything is about you know short term news cycles and short term election cycles. And so, you know, this is just a, simply a continuation of a very flawed game that is now baked in the process and how things operate in D.C. Yeah, and Robin, um, let's give you the last word on this topic. Um, so, you know, as, as we're heading into November and the economy in, in the last segment's poll that we uh, put up from Fox News, I mean, the economy was second. So that is a big deal. And regardless of the theatrics of, you know, the court of public opinion and court TV, as we've been discussing, you know, ad nauseum because of all of these uh, litigation efforts against Donald Trump. And of course, the left is touting that. But um, realistically, that is easing the pressure off of Joe Biden in terms of actually addressing the economy. The White House has put out some messaging trying to tout that, you know, somehow the economy is coming back, the jobs numbers, all of those things. But I don't really see the average American buying it. And so do you think that the economy is going to stay roughly around that number two slot in terms of voters? Or is this kind of you know, threat to democracy that the left is pushing that that they believe is Donald Trump, may that outweigh it? And, and is that potentially why we see the polls so close? I mean, to me, that kind of makes sense if you look at the clash of issues that way. Uh, yes, uh, Alan West put it brilliantly by re reminding us about James Carville's comment about it's the economy, stupid. It's always the economy. Uh, but look, I'm a Democrat, and I want everyone right now to go to usdebtclock.debtclock dot org because the nation's debt right now is 34 trillion dollars uh and growing that means the per capita and i've got young children that means that we're passing this debt down to our children which is uh at 122 thousand dollars per person right now per capita uh so you know it's unforgivable and it did grow by several trillion dollars under donald trump joe biden is saying that he reduced it by a, a fractional amount but that's not going to resonate with Americans. We've got to do something serious 
about the, the national debt. Uh, it's crushing, Jenna. Yeah, so well said. And you know, Representative Thomas Massey with his little clock that he wears all the time. I mean, I, I hope that the House is paying attention to that. But we'll be right back with the power panel to discuss more of a debate preview right after this. Hi, friends, Jenna Ellis, host of Jenna Ellis Tonight, and we are experiencing instability at every level. Our government lacks leadership and Bidenomics has been an utter disaster. The economy is in a fragile state. Inflation has been a constant issue. High interest rates have put significant pressure on the real estate market. There have been major bank failures and many analysts say a stock market correction is likely overdue. We have global conflicts in Europe and the Middle East, and those have the potential to spread, but gold has soared to record highs, even among the tensions. So there are so many reasons that Americans should consider wise investing and investments in gold and silver, and legacy precious metals is the gold standard. I love Legacy Precious Metals because of their zero-hassle, education-first approach. They can help you roll your traditional IRA into a gold IRA or ship metals directly to your house. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, download the free investor guide, and I have read it. There is so much valuable information there. Friends, now is the time to not roll the dice on your hard-earned money, find out about the growth potential that is in gold and that gold offers you. Contact Legacy Precious Metals and make sure to tell them that I sent you. And we're back with our power panel for Thursday's roundup of the top trending topics. And next Thursday is the first and possibly the only presidential debate. So stay tuned for a very special episode of Jenna Ellis tonight that is going to air right after that debate. We'll have live reaction for 90 minutes just following that debate. So uh, tune in at the Salem News Channel. And so so let's start with you. Um, there have been reports that suggest that Donald Trump is not preparing at all for a debate. Um, do you think if those reports are true that that is wise for someone who hasn't been in a debate head to head with Biden for four years and has really only done a lot of speeches and of course rallies, um, should Donald Trump be preparing? Well, I think with Trump's style, right? I mean, he was he won the 2016 uh, primary, right? With debate performances that were first and foremost entertaining. They weren't diving into the weeds on policy issues. Again, I think most voters you know, are not gonna be persuaded by policy points. What I think Trump needs to take away from this debate performance is be seen as the entertaining happy warrior again after a 2020 debate cycle where he was you know, very aggressive, right? It, it was, he was cutting off Biden a lot. I know the, the, the mic rules in this one will, will probably play a role there. But you, know, you need viral moments of Donald Trump having fun, I think. Um, which again was a big spirit of the 2016 campaign. I think he lost that in 2020. And so as much as I would like to have a debate that's diving into the seriousness of the you know, spending issues and going in the weeds on regulatory policy, things like that, ultimately I think this is gonna come about vibes more than substance. And really it's a race to the bottom, right? If, if Biden can avoid having a catastrophic meltdown, that's a, that's a win for him. If Trump is able to get some zingers in and, and have some of those viral clips that people are talking about the next day, that's a win for him. Again, unfortunately, that's just the, the state of modern politics. But I think yeah, I'm not too concerned about a lack of serious debate prep, given the seriousness of a public discussion right now. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, a lot of people are tuning in for entertainment value and certainly those viral clips that'll uh, be posted after the debate and kind of the one liners and the zingers, which uh, last time, Robin Byro, uh, Joe Biden had several of those. And so, you know, the the standard, I think, for Joe Biden to be a success of the debate is just getting through it all coherently, which is the bare minimum for just any human being. Um, but in terms of debate prep, uh, we haven't heard anything from the White House or, or the Biden campaign really about uh, prep for Biden. What do you anticipate or what would you tell him to do besides, you know, potentially, uh, you know, just stand coherent, which seems to be a problem for him? <laughs> uh, you know, I've got to be intellectually honest here, Jenna. I get nervous anytime Joe Biden opens his mouth, uh, not not because of his age, but because of the stutter. Uh, and, you know, that there's no faulting him for that, but he can fumble over his words sometimes and it makes him look kind of stupid. Uh, and I hate to say that that way, um, but 
I literally hold my breath sometimes when he's speaking just to see if he can get the words out. Uh, and it's a problem. So, uh, you know, but he's got 50 years of experience debating. So I think he'll, I think he'll be just fine no matter what. Uh, that's one thing he's got going for him that maybe Trump doesn't is several decades more experience, uh, especially debating than, than Trump does. Yeah, so Alan West, um, just in the last about two minutes we have in this segment, um, let's talk about that format because certainly someone with more debate experience, it may be an upper hand, but definitely this being in Atlanta with CNN and the moderators. I mean, did the Trump campaign just kind of give the entire debate away just for the opportunity to go head to head with Biden and uh, maybe also RFK Jr. if he gets on the stage? Well, you know, one of the things that we say in the military is that, you know, all plans, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And so you have to be ready to go in there and do what is necessary. And you cannot run away from that challenge. Uh, and I'm concerned. I don't want to see this become, you know, from, you know, Maximus in the movie Gladiator when, you know, someone stands up and says, are you entertained? I'm not looking to be entertained. I think the American people want to see leadership. And if I could recommend something to Donald Trump, go back and look at the Ronald Reagan debates with uh, Walter Mondale and also with Jimmy Carter, because that was a person that was very serious, talked about the issues, but yet had that sense of humor, that sense of levity. And, you know, no one will ever forget that line. You know, it's morning in America. And are you better off than where you were for you? Yeah. Yeah, evoke that from uh, from the debates of old. So, um, gentlemen, we'll be right back with more of the power panel in the last segment. Uh, but wise words, leadership over entertainment. We'll be right back. Well, earlier this week, the Colorado Supreme Court heard oral argument on yet another masterpiece cake shop case controversy. This one was initiated the very same day that the Supreme Court in 2018 issued a resounding win for Jack Phillips, the cake baker in Colorado, who simply refuses to use his artistic skills and talents to design a custom cake with a message that he fundamentally disagrees with. But the Rainbow Mafia and the leftists continue to push for their view of reality. And so the argument at the Supreme Court was over a cake that initially a person who is a trans woman or biological man went into the shop and was served like every other customer, asked for a cake that was inside pink with blue frosting, didn't say what the event was for. So initially, of course, Masterpiece was okay with that. Then the customer specifically said that this was in celebration of a gender transition. And so Jack Phillips, of course, can't design that as a Christian and as a conservative. And so this is what Jack Phillips had to say outside of the Supreme Court building after oral arguments. At Masterpiece Cake Shop, we serve everyone, including people who identify as LGBT. And this has been true since the beginning and will be true long after this day. Whether we create a custom cake always depends on what the message the cake will express is never on who requests it. This means that I will not recreate a custom cake expressing any message that violates my religious beliefs, regardless of who asked for it. Over the last 10 years, Colorado officials and activists have tried to punish me for my religious beliefs. They have even tried to change my beliefs. Through all this, I believe firmly that free speech is for everyone, and no one should be forced to express a message that they don't believe. No artist like myself and Lori Smith, who's here today, should be forced to create something that promotes a message they don't believe. I am thankful for the opportunity for this case to be heard today at this court. And I hope that the court will agree with the U.S. Supreme Court, who got it right in 303 Creative, Lori Smith's case. The Supreme Court reaffirmed that Colorado cannot force artists to express messages inconsistent with their beliefs. We hope that the Colorado Supreme Court will do the same. The government cannot force Americans to express messages that they don't believe. Thank you. Let's bring in Mike Donnelly, who is a law professor and an attorney. And Mike, um, you and I have talked a lot in the last few years about the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, which is basically a modern day star chamber. And also this is being heard at the Colorado Supreme Court, which infamously removed Trump from the ballot. They were uh, eventually overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. So your thoughts from a legal perspective on how this case 
uh, should ultimately be decided. You know, we'll see what Colorado does with it. Well, I'm not hopeful that Colorado is going to find in Jack Phillips favor. They certainly haven't uh, indicated um, that they are um, interested in, in in supporting his position. And so I, I expect that they won't uh, and that he'll have to appeal to the Supreme Court. And it's an interesting uh, case because of the way it was set up. And it really is about uh, attempting to impose orthodoxy on someone. And, and it is all about getting Jack Phillips to agree that he's wrong and that and that is wrong. Um, the, the court should not be used to impose another person's viewpoint on another person. Uh, and what they're going to try to argue is that, you know, this blue and pink cake, um, that Jack Phillips had agreed to design a blue and pink cake before he knew what it was for. And they're gonna to try to say, see, see, we told you, see, he discriminates, see? Um, and, and the key here, I think, is what Jack said in his statement. It was a custom cake and he had to make it himself and it was intended to promote a particular message. So, you know, if the Colorado Supreme Court wants to get overturned again, they'll find against Jack. If they want the Supreme Court of the United States to reinform them about what the First Amendment means, then they will hold against Jack. Yeah, and I really hope that the Colorado Supreme Court does the right thing here, um, because let's talk about symbolic speech, though, because a lot of the controversy and the oral argument from the leftist Supreme Court judges in 303 Creative uh, that was just argued last year, for example, said, well, you know, some of these symbols aren't necessarily speech, and how can you uh, profess to know exactly, you know, what a picture contains um, on a website that is, showing a same-sex couple, for example. I mean, well, speech has always been symbolic and our laws have always covered symbolic speech, so like burning the American flag, for example. I mean, for all of these different ways that uh, even nonverbal speech is used to communicate a message is very clear. And Jack Phillips, not wanting to participate in speech, even if it's symbolic, he has that right here in America and the government should not compel him otherwise. Uh, absolutely right, Jenna, and no one should, including this attorney who's confused about their gender and wants to sue Jack in order to make him recant of his deeply held religious beliefs. That's the problem. This person could have gotten a cake from anywhere to serve their purpose, but their purpose wasn't to get a cake. Their purpose was to make Jack Phillips recant of his deeply held religious convictions, and that's the problem, is that particular side of the argument is trying to use the courts to impose its political views or its whatever you want to call them perspectives on the rest of us, uh, and that's wrong. They shouldn't do that. Um, you know, and the court is has an opportunity here. You know, the court is really engaging in a lot of review of its First Amendment jurisprudence here. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Louisiana Ten Commandments case, and so the court is going to have opportunities in the next five years or more to clarify. And it's changing its views. It used to be that. Um, it had the lemon test, which said the government can't get involved in promoting a particular view of religion, and it had this test. That test seems to have been abandoned, and the court seems to be going back to a different test, which is more about deeply rooted traditions and 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 um, moral views. And so we're having this conversation in our country: what's moral? What's true? What's right? What's wrong? And this is a conversation we need to have. And I think Jack Phillips' case is just part of that conversation. Absolutely. And we also need to add to that conversation, as you and I often do, uh, what agency of government, if at all, has the power to impose or restrict certain views. Uh, you mentioned the Louisiana Ten Commandments case. I mean, this arose out of the people's representatives passing a bill saying that the Ten Commandments text should be displayed in classrooms of public schools. And constitutionally, that, that should fly and that, that should be okay. Well, it should be, but we've had a big debate in this country going back to the 60s when the Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to allow prayer in the schools, all the way through uh, 1980 when the court ruled in Stone v. Graham on a, on a law exactly like the Louisiana law that no, Ten Commandments posters in classrooms violates the First Amendment. Now, they used the Lemon Test explicitly in that case. Fast forward into the 90s, we have, we've been having the debates over the Ten Commandment monuments, which could go one way or the other, depending on who's on the court. Uh, and then to now, where the court will have to overturn Stone v. Graham if they're going to rule in favor of Louisiana once that case eventually gets there. Do we really need the Supreme Court to tell us 
what posters we can have in our classrooms or what kinds of cakes we can bake? Is that where we are in this country? I mean, that's to me the fundamental problem is, uh, you know, we've, we're, <laughs> we're confused about a lot of things in this country, so we need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and I think that's that's putting it very mildly that we're confused. But um, but th this is the broader question of how do we live together in a moral and upright society when there is so much clash over the definition just of reality. I mean, these are things that the Supreme Court is going to have to face, and I'm not sure that they're even really that equipped because as our founders recognized, our constitution is made only for a moral and upright people. It's not really that adequate for any other. So. Um, and just the last minute we have here, I mean, what is the path forward? Well, you just quoted one of my favorite founders and one of my favorite quotes uh, that was John Adams, who said that in his letter to the Massachusetts militia, which is a fantastic uh, letter that everyone listening should go Google and read it because that little snippet is great, but there's a whole lot around it. So go read John Adams' letter. But yeah, we're gonna have to grapple with this. I'm glad you're talking about it. I'm glad your audience is interested. And so I think we should just keep having these conversations. Ultimately, it does come down to federalism and, you know, why does the Supreme Court even have the authority to tell states what to do anyway? Maybe we can talk about that sometime. Yeah, well, we'll have to have you back, Mike Donnelly, as we always do for legal eagle segments and to get uh, all of your wisdom and brilliance. But these are the conversations that we need to have. And uh, every citizen who cares about our U.S. Congress and keeping government in its bounds and making sure that we have the blessings of liberty for the future have to be well read on these issues because it's not just about bigotry or tolerance or any of those other issues. This is all about freedom and the true definition of liberty. So we'll be right back with more. And look, let's welcome back in our power panel for the last top trending topic. We have Robin Byro, who is a Democrat strategist, Etho Bishop, who is content director for Mises, and Alan West, who is the chair of the Dallas GOP. So this headline coming from Yahoo Sports, of course, this is Pride Month, uh, June, but a new national gay flag football league sparked controversy in the NFL world. The Buffalo Bills, among other NFL teams, are at the center of controversy after announcing their support for the National Gay Flag Football League, or the NGFFL. The NFL organization shocked the sports world by showing its support for the NGFFL and revealing a sponsorship to launch a chapter in Buffalo and 27 other cities. The NGFFL is a nonprofit sports organization that seeks to promote American flag football's positive social and athletic enjoyment. After hearing the news, many sports fans initially thought the National Gay Flag Football League was a joke. However, once they realized it was real, the NFL faced backlash. So, Robin, I'll come to you first, but I loved some of the memes that were like, hey, we have the Dallas Cowboys. So, you know, obviously we've already had a gay flag football <laughs> league. You know, some, of, some of those just like really good one-liners. But, I mean, come on, do we really need a gay flag football league? I mean, th this is just becoming a, a ridiculous social construct type of push to just rainbow mafia everything. Jenna, it's all a money grab. Uh, look, and I'm speaking as a gay man. Uh, I see corporations, including the NFL, just doing whatever they can for Pride Month just to rake in that money. Uh, I'll tell you, as a gay man, I don't get it. And in some ways, I'm almost offended. I think it would be almost less offensive to me as a gay man if they went back to powder puff football. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, that, that's a great point. And so, um, Alan, you know, maybe that wasn't as, I don't know if you're a Dallas Cowboys fan and if you agree with that meme, but um, but overall, I mean, you know, I think a lot of the reaction was, is this serious? And why would the Buffalo Bills and the NFL really care? But we've seen this controversy and this divide where there were at least 17 teams that didn't have pride jersey this month. And now there's some teams in the NFL. This is kind of a big split. So, you know, where do you see this going in terms of the NFL itself still pushing this uh, pride or, as I call it, the queer theory agenda? 
Well, look, I was born and raised in Georgia. I went to the University of Tennessee. The only kind of football that exists out there is SEC football. That's where we have the, the real football and all these NFL guys. They're just a bunch of paid, you know, happy to go lucky, whatever's. But I think the most important thing, you go back and you think about how the NBA had the Black Lives Matter logos all over their courts and everything, and they saw a precipitous drop. In, uh, in their revenues. And the NFL suffered also with all the end racism, Black Lives Matter. And now we see that Black Lives Matter was a really a big Ponzi scheme. And now look at what is happening now with the Olympic team putting a snub on uh, Caitlin Clark. So I think that it's about time that we stop worrying about a lot of these cultural issues. Let's just have sports. Let's just have people go out there and play baseball, football, hockey, or whatever, and stop trying to, you know, make them offshoots of whatever is trending culturally. Yeah, so well said. I mean, people, to, to your point earlier, though, I mean, most people want um, some form of entertainment, and it hopefully shouldn't be just in our politics. We should be concerned about policy. But sports, um, having all of this politics around, it makes it frustrating for a lot of viewers. Um, but who, anyway, is even watching flag football? Like, is that even televised on ESPN or something? I mean, I had no idea that there even was a national, you know, flag football league that anybody even cared about. Well, the real questions will be, you know, can you bet on it um, and, and, you know, on <laughs> online apps here? Uh, but, but this whole thing, though, is, it's weird because it's it's kind of an exclusionary event when the big push has been about inclusion and things like that, right? You know, elevating you know, gay athletes and things like that. This is a weird exclusionary aspect. But it does go to a much broader problem here, which is the majority of NFL owners are Republicans. They're conservatives. Um, you know, they, you know, or at least their, their families was, you know, when, when kids inherited the team. And so you have this larger problem where you have an organization that is largely owned by conservatives that feel the need to bend over backwards for these sort of cultural left-wing agenda items so that you know even ownership of these enterprises isn't enough to deal with the political pressures to create all this identity politics panderizing. And until you start addressing those problems, we can, we can talk about elections, we can talk about this sort of stuff. This is what actually matters where the actual economic power of these large corporations are being dictated to the left, no matter what consumers want, no matter what uh, you know, the voters want, no matter anything else going on, as long as that economic power continues to trend leftwards, then everything else is going to end up following behind. And so uh, this is much, it, it's a silly story, but it speaks to a much larger problem that we have in the American economic and political system right now. Yeah, really well said. Uh, and, you know, and it also raises the important question, I think, too. I mean, how are they going to keep it exclusionary? Because the left has been suing for men to be involved in women's sports and, and to have non-exclusionary. And so how are they going to determine, you know, who identifies as what? And doesn't that go against their own construct? So it seems very hypocritical here, but um, I just think it's ridiculous. But gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the power panel. That is all the time we have here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Make it a great night and I'll see you tomorrow.